Uh, joining me right now to go over all of this and the latest development, William Barr's uh, uh, remarks as to the Durham report and how he does not think there's going to be any criminal charges uh, that stem from this. Our good friend Andy McCarthy, best-selling author and contributing editor at National Review. Uh, and Andy has been, he has some great pieces about this that we cite regularly on the show. And uh, he's written also a lot about this. Uh, thank you for joining me. Always good to have you, my friend. And I we talked a little bit earlier about William Barr's remarks that, yeah, there's not going to be, doesn't look as though anyway, that there's going to be uh, any kind of uh, criminal or criminal uh, charges or any sort of uh, criminality stemming from this, according to the Durham investigation. And he made the point that, you know, abuse does not necessarily mean criminal. I and I understand what he's saying, although it's 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 difficult to swallow because I think people want justice and some of them may be using that as a synonym for vengeance. But um, I'd like your your reaction on, on Barr's remarks. Well, Dana, thanks so much for having me. And I, I have to say that, you know, in um, months of getting to go around the country and talk about the book, I wrote about this caper. Yes, ball uh, of collusion, in, everyone. In my own, but in, including in my in my mom's own house with my own family, I had this whole riff that I uh, had prepared explaining that you know, look, abuses of power are not necessarily violations of the penal code, and you know, there already has been some accountability here because none of the officials who were involved in the improprieties that went on are in their jobs anymore right. and the reaction i got was to need to duck because they wanted to throw stuff at me what? because what they basically <laughs> want to know is who's being drawn and quartered at high noon right. you know, it's not even <laughs> indictments aren't enough right so i i i understand how people feel um but at the same time it doesn't you know uh, you have to look at this if you have if you're trained the way i was trained um, you know, there's bad behavior, and then there's behavior that uh, violates the criminal code. And a great example is what you were just talking about, which with the unmasking, which I'm I'm, mm. I'm, I'm so confused about whether we can call this spying or not now. Um, <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> but but um, you know, unmasking is something that is prescribed for the intelligence agencies to follow. And, and what we're talking about is keeping concealed the identities of American citizens mainly who are what, as they say, incidentally picked up when the intelligence community is targeting foreign people for uh, surveillance. You know, the, mm -hmm. like if I had a, a wiretap on a mafia guy when I used to be a, a criminal prosecutor, um, you know, if the fellas decided to call for pizza for lunch and they called up the pizzeria, I got the pizza guy on the phone. Right. right? Yeah. He wasn't a target of the investigation, but he's incidentally picked up. So what they did was they, you know, unmasked those identities, which they're not supposed to do. But those rules about minimization are court ordered rules that go to um, how the court directs them to do surveillance there's no right. if you go to the federal penal code to title 18 of the u.s code which spells out all the federal crimes or almost all of them there's nothing in there about minimization hmm. so you know generally speaking when we're talking about abuse of power um we really ought to aspire to have like public officials who can do better than stay one step ahead of the grand jury because right. those people aren't fit to be in public office. But usually what we want is to get them out of public office, whether they can be prosecuted, you know, whether their abusive behavior rises to the level of a crime that you could prove beyond a reasonable doubt is usually not only beside the point, it's a, it's a much tougher question. Right. Very, a lot tougher of a question. And I, when I was listening to, and we played Barr's remarks earlier, when I was listening to his explanation of this, I, it, it made me think of John Adams in a way, and I talked about this earlier also, sure. defending those, those British soldiers uh, after, after the uh, Boston Massacre. 
And, you know, ultimately how one of his motivations was that consistency with rule of law. I mean, how are you on the cusp of the yep. war of independence and you're, you're going to violate just this one instance, the very principle that you claim is motivating you. And that I think that that the same of that can be said with the bar situation. I mean, you you're, if you're wanting to protect rule of law. Well, you can't really so much do that while undermining it, even if it's just this one instance. And and, and essentially, that's what you yeah. would be doing by calling for more uh, penalty than what the law currently allows for. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, Barr has said from the time that he had his confirmation hearing that his priority in taking this job, and it had to be a big priority after eight years of Obama weaponizing mm -hmm. the law enforcement and intelligence apparatus of the government, was to get the prosecutors out of the politics and the politics out of the Justice Department. And I think that is, as someone who is very proud of having worked at the Justice Department for a very long time, uh, I couldn't agree with that more. I don't think the Justice Department should be deciding our elections or even involved in our elections mm -hmm. unless there's some, you know, really obvious criminality. And, you know, it's under these circumstances, because everyone wants poetic justice, right? They want right. comeuppance for the people who did the abusive things they did. Um, it, it, it's hard to swallow this, as you, as you mentioned, but if, if your goal is to get the politics out of the Justice Department and vice versa, probably not the best way to go about that to bring what would be the most controversial political indictment in history. And I think, you know, you, you go back to John Adams, which is a which is a great example. I would go back to a to a um, somewhat more modern example, which is Nixon. Um, I've always thought looking at that case that there's not a prayer that Nixon would actually have been prosecuted or, or that he could have been convicted at trial for what he was accused of. And I think what people forget is that, you know, when, when President Ford pardoned Nixon, he didn't do it for Nixon. He did it for the country. The idea mm -hmm. was to, like, get everybody past that whole controversy. Um, but I think because he pardoned Nixon – there's kind of an assumption out there that, oh, well, Nixon would have been convicted if it hadn't been for Ford pardoning him. And I just don't think that's true. And and maybe that's why we haven't learned this lesson up until now. But, you know, everybody points to Nixon as the you know, textbook example of abuse of power. And I don't think you could have prosecuted him for what he was for what he was accused of. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's a good point. You bring up in one of your latest pieces at National Review the real story you you ask unmasking the real stories when Flynn wasn't actually masked in the first place and that yeah. I actually I mean I thought this was incredibly informative because I thought when I read the headline which you know obviously uh, in, in intended to pique your your interest and be provocative on that level I thought well, well he was unmasked though that's the thing but not the case not the case at all tell me about this because this is a great point that I you taught me well, he was unmasked many times, as we've now seen. But the thing is, he wasn't unmasked in connection with the one thing that we're told right. with the driving bit of information uh, with respect to the investigation against him, which is this big conversation between him and Kislyak, mm -hmm. uh, the Russian ambassador, during which Flynn didn't commit any impropriety, didn't make any deal with the Russians, didn't do any of the things that the Obama people say they suspected him of to the point where they were, you know, reduced to talking about this cockamamie Logan Act as a potential way <laughs> right. to prosecute him. But but the most interesting thing, if we're going to talk about this in terms of unmasking, mm. is that conversation occurs on December 29th. According to the records that we've now seen, the last unmasking of Flynn was December 28th. This is around the time of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then there's not another one until January 5th. And that's important because we now know from the other documents we've seen that everybody was talking about Flynn and Kislyak at the high levels of the Obama administration by January 3rd, which is two days before the unmasking. So clearly they didn't unmask him on this conversation. There's no record of it. And I suspect that that's because he was never masked in the first place. And I think that had to be because he was intercepted as a result of an intelligence program of, of the kind that does not come under FISA, which is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance right. Act, uh, and is not subject to 
uh, masking rules. And I suspect it's probably either a CIA operation or something we got from a foreign intelligence service. Because one of the things we haven't focused on so much is it just so happens that on that day, uh, the 29th, Flynn was taking a brief uh, vacation before starting his new responsibilities. He was in the Dominican Republic. He wasn't in the United States. And I think it's highly unlikely that Kislyak was in the United States because at New Year's, if you're Russian, you're in Russia. You know, right. you know um, <laughs> and no one's in Washington, right? Hmm. Um, so I suspect these two guys were both out of the United States. They weren't subject to the usual FISA jurisdiction, and they intercepted this a different way. Very, very intriguing. Very intriguing indeed. Andy McCarthy, best-selling author. You have to get his book. It is Ball of Collusion, The Plot to Rig an Election and Destroy a Presidency, former Chief Assistant U.S. Attorney. Andy, always such a pleasure to get your, your expertise on this. Thank you so much for your time.